Hello and good afternoon, good evening, good night, wherever you're watching and welcome to Developing with Carcroach TV. I love the intro music. <laughs> um, I could just leave it on all the time and just dance out, dance party at uh, Developing with Cockroach TV. Uh, but we'll silence it for now. Goodbye, music. Love you. Um, this is a show where we are launching a developer-focused success program with a series of workshops and office hours to help you tackle your biggest developer aspirations together and how we can help you get the most out of your Cockroach GB experience. We hope that you have some experience with SQL here of Cockroach Cloud or the new Cockroach Serverless. We would love to talk to you and help you improve your experience. Help us help improve your experience, definitely. So every Wednesday are the modules. We're thinking we will cut back to every other week. And then every Thursday at the same bat time, same bat channel is the office hours. So tomorrow you can AMA. Today, pretty much you can AMA too, but we have two modules from two fabulous experts. And we want to talk about, what are we talking about today? Build CRUD REST APIs. Let me introduce you to the brilliant Jesse Lynn architect, enterprise architect with Cockroach Labs. Can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. This is Jesse. I've been with Cockroach since December last year, and I've been uh, working with database and coding for a very long time and definitely love to see everyone here. How did you get to Cockroach Labs, Jesse? Like, what was that path like? What was that path? That good question. Well, I've been working with, you know, customers and on database for quite some time. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I've always been in the industry and there's a few former coworkers came to Cockroach. So I thought, you know, I should give it a try. Nice. And John St. John, also an enterprise architect. Um, tell me about your path and a little introduction as well. Sure. So my name is John St. John and I'm an enterprise architect like Jesse. Um, actually, Jesse uh, was my my mentor, what we call a roach mate when I started oh, nice. about yeah, three and a, about three and a half months ago. So she's been great been learning a lot from her. She can keep me honest today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're good roach mates. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, nice. yeah. yeah, we get along great. Um, my journey, uh, like Jesse, I mean, I've, I've been uh, working in engineering. At, started out as an engineer, worked in uh, application development, uh, cloud uh, infrastructure and architecture, database development for quite a few years, and uh, came from a company that was focused on consumer privacy and building a platform. And I worked as a solutions architect there before coming to Cockroach and uh, just really was excited about uh, Cockroach technology, the role working with customers and developers uh, and getting back to some of my roots uh, in database uh, development and nice. administration. So I'm, I'm having a blast. Nice. Nice. Welcome. Three and a half months with your old hat now. And I <laughs> am <you> <laughs> I'm Rain Leander. I'm a developer architect or developer I've said architect so much, now I'm just going to say architect for everything from now on. I'm a developer advocate here at Cockroach Labs, and I'm kind of a database new. Like my path to come into databases was through web development in the late 90s, early 2000s. So I was playing with MySQL back when you had to install the operating system and Apache and everything else, and I don't recommend it. Uh, today, I am a Python developer, so I'm more of a Python application developer, and I love to help people get started with CockroachDB, especially now that our new product has launched. Does anyone want to talk about what came to be as of Tuesday last week? A little Super bit. Less. 
Do yeah. Like <laughs> yeah. So we have a new offering. We're not going to we're not going to deep dive into that today. We're going to talk about CRUD REST APIs. That is a lot of letters. And by the way, if you're watching this live, please put your comments below. We would love to hear from you. Jesse and John each are going to do a presentation, a module today. Are those already up in our GitHub repo? Yes. Yay. Yeah, if you want to send the link out, yeah. Awesome. Okay. So who wants to go first? Jesse, John, John, yeah, Jesse. I'll go first. Yay. Okay, let's All hear right. it. Let me share screen. Mm -hmm. So just so you know, for folks that are, are joining and wondering kind of what's coming up, um, I'm going to piggyback off of what uh, Jesse does. Um, oh, there it is. And I'll be doing a deployment with Google Cloud Run of the REST API that Jesse's going to walk through. So nice. Kind of a two-parter. Yep. Yeah, so Jesse. we'll show you how you build, and then John will show you how to uh, deploy it. And uh, we hope, you know, this gives you um, some ideas about what the process will look like and starting off uh, with some big dreams in mind and uh, starting quickly, easily today and how it's written uh, quickly um, as you, you know, put more features. So let's, uh, let's get started. So as a developer, um, I always wanted to build uh, some game-changing application. I believe you too. You know, uh, a category killer, uh, making positive impacts to the to the lives um, of every every day. Um, that involves uh, giving user great experience, low latency wherever they are, and. Uh, we we also dream about you know that as the app succeed, um, you will see millions of users around the globe will access your application, and despite um, some disasters, you know we've all heard um, some cloud vent, uh, region will will have some issues or DNS server might have issues, but we want to be able to continue to operate. Uh, your application and, and your business, um, despite those uh, failures and disasters. And as a developer, I wanted to focus on building the features, building the greatest and latest and push them out the door instead of thinking about, oh, do I need to patch the server? Do I need to do upgrade? Um, that kind of thing, right? And uh, lastly, but also very importantly, whether I'm building a uh, in-app purchase or I'm building a new payment services, I want to make sure the data is accurate. Um, I don't want to worry about uh, dirty reads or phantom reads. Those are the things that database should take care of for me. And with all those big dreams and goals in mind, I think it means uh, a lot that you, we are expecting from the database. Um, so first of all, the database should be performant uh, and uh, ideally, no matter where the, uh, the request comes from, it, it will provide uh, a high latency, uh, a low latency yeah. and high throughput. Yes. Um, the database can scale and it's elastically, and this is one thing the serverless can, you know, provide uh, really, really well. You can scale up and down, uh, depend on your demands uh, from the the users, and uh, the database should be able to resilient uh, to to survive uh, outages. And um, also, as a service, it should give you very low overhead uh, of operation. Uh, it should be a managed service and just work. Um, and lastly, um, being a database uh, and in to ensure data accuracy, uh, the asset, uh, being asset compliant and be able to support transactions uh, across the tables and the database are very important. So, uh, with those 
um, goals in mind and understand what it takes to get there are important so that it will set you on the right path um, without the need to re-architect as you scale and as you grow um, because refactoring code is is time consuming and uh, data migration is expensive and it could also put a downtime on your business. So uh, with that understanding, we wanted to say, you know, what can we do today? How can we get started? So today you can go to Cockroach uh, Cloud and start a um, I start to use a serverless um, service right away with a few click. Um, you can create a database and soon you'll be able to um, access the service via APIs and start local development um, today. Um, so in this session, we use uh, Node and you know React, um, not React, but Node and JavaScript development um, as examples, because it's really easy to pick up, um, but the same principle applies to other languages as well. Nice. So we're we um, using React and Node, but you uh, don't have to be familiar with JavaScript in order to do an application like this. Right, absolutely. Um, and uh, so CockroachDB to you know get things started, um, it looks to any developer, it's just a relational database that you are you might be familiar with, you know, by going to school, taking online classes. Um, and it is well compatible with Postgres. What it means is that you have the toolboxes in the relational database, such as uh, foreign keys, which ensures uh, integrity, uh, reference data integrity. Um, you can do, you know, cascading delete and cascade up, updates, and uh, it supports a, a certain normal form uh, data schema. Um, it, it the database also, you know, gives you asset compliant transactions, and CockroachDB operates at the highest level of isolation, which is called serializable. And if you're interested to know more about uh, what serializable means and how uh, it is different from recommit and other levels of isolation, uh, uh, write a comment down and let us know. And we're more than happy to you know, uh, give an, another talk uh, to focus on that. And uh, uh, it, uh, the if you are familiar with you know, Postgres, then you can use all the data types and uh, the SQL uh, functions that you're familiar with. And uh, when you write uh, programs, uh, we're usually uh, good with uh, the Postgres dri drivers and ORMs that you might be familiar with. So it's really easy uh, to get things started. Uh, we also support uh, working with um, third-party tools such as uh, dBeaver, DataGrip, or any other tools that you might be familiar with in your workflow. And Cockroach DB Serverless is just a uh, database as a service that can elastically scale, uh, so you don't have to worry about uh, you know maintaining the database and uh, uh, how to uh, size the database correctly. Alrighty, so we have uh, a question from Manish Rawat. Okay. I am so sorry if I'm butchering your name. No. Um, can we use Postgres client directly with CockroachDB? I know we have ORMs and whatnot set up, but I've never actually been asked that. <laughs> that is a um, Interesting question. question right? Yeah, that's a good question. So we do usually uh, recommend that you use um, as you develop um, use Cockroach DB client, which is a very simple uh, small binary that you download. Mm -hmm. um, but 
if you have other local tools, uh, for example, dBeaver or you know data grip, that kind of uh, IDEs, then just hook it up with um, Postgrade uh, driver, and then you'll be able to access um, Cockroach DB. Very cool. Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna maybe weigh in on that as well, because um, when I read that question, I wasn't thinking about the you know official Postgres client. I was like, yeah, of course, you know, you can use really any Postgres exactly. compatible. Uh, client, exactly. um, yeah. So I think, um, and kind of to, to reinforce what Jesse said, um, you know, Postgres comes with you know an official client, and Cockroach comes with an official client, and the Cockroach client has some additional functionality that you would want to take advantage of, just like the Postgres client does. Um, but if you have a, a library that works with Postgres in any language, um, you can use that along with an ORM that's built on top of it. Um, yeah thank you guys that's great yeah thank Should we you. go to the next slide yeah cool all right now you have a prototype what do you do next well you have the prototype working in your local you know uh, environment that is accessing to the serverless db then typically um well, ideally, um, you wanted to integrate it with CI/CD, but today John's going to show you, you know, deploy it um, on to um, Cloud Run, and then um, as it scale, uh, as you, you have you know more demands from uh, your, your users, then the containers can scale elastically, and um, just like you know. React can be deployed on CDN and it can be spread out uh, all around the world. Uh, CockroachDB can also be de de deployed in multiple regions. And we put by putting the data closer to where your user is at, we can provide uh, lower latency, great performance, and ultimately, you know, a great user experience. Uh, with that. I think we can go to uh, a live demo. Nice. So we do have a request for a different demo. We're going to go forward with John, but I just wanted to address this really quick question. Ashutosh was asking for an example in C Sharp Blazor server with. Um, I'll take it. I'll take out your shared screen <laughs> um, with server-side pagination. Um, today we are working with JavaScript as opposed to Blazor, um, which is, by the way, for those of you who don't know, that's a feature in the ASP.NET for building interactive web UIs. Um, we do have a link, but we haven't had time to read it through, uh, but this might help. I'm putting this directly into the chat below, by the way. It's on it's on the DevTO blog. Thank you. Yeah, John. there's a there's a ton of of sample apps and blog posts and with with all different yeah. types of RMs and frameworks and all that stuff. So mm -hmm. that was one one that I found that um, like Rain said, we haven't really had a chance to fully review. But um, if you do search Cockroach DB, you know, C sharp blazer, you'll probably find a few examples and probably have some code in there that you could leverage. Yeah, definitely. Uh, for today, we are doing a JavaScript demo. Is this where John takes over? Um, actually, no. I will start. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But soon, we'll get this word. I got you. Uh -huh. Should I? Am I still sharing? You are now. Okay, cool. All right. So if you got the link, um, here's the path to uh, the sample uh, REST APIs um, application. And uh, we can switch over to uh, the repo. So uh, really quickly, there is a uh, markdown. You can follow uh, the labs. And we're going to just you know basically go through this really quickly today. And with that, so this application is under this data and an OJS uh, REST folder. So first of all, what once you have the repo downloaded, what you wanted to do is, uh, well, actually, 
let me go back to um, the serverless UI first. Once you download it, the first thing you want to do is to create a cluster. So when you log into Quarkoach Cloud, um, uh, you'll see a list of uh, clusters. And here you can create a uh, you know serverless database and uh, choose a cloud vendor where you want the database to be. And you can put a span limit. Um, and by default, uh, it will be free. Uh, it will be free forever. And give it a name. And within a few seconds, you will have your database up and running. And uh, you want to, uh, in order to connect it, we recommend you to download the, the DB client. It's a very sim small uh, binary. And then you want it to uh, download the certificate as well um, to connect to the secure cluster or secure database. And then the last piece is uh, you want to copy this connection string uh, with your passwords and uh, username. So that's all to get your database app and running. Uh, I already have a database. Uh, up. And once you have it, uh, you'll see the storage usage, how much, how much uh, request or, you know, um, access you have used under your quota and um, the storage and the trends, the usage trends here as well. We'll take a look at that once we uh, run some um, uh, some queries against the database. Nice. All right, let's switch back to the uh, code piece. Okay, so once you have your, you know, the connection strings and uh, username, password, you wanted to copy this environment template um, and update that and change it to a .in file uh, and save it in the same uh, folder. And then you want to update the pass to the certificate that you downloaded earlier as well. Mm -hmm. Once you have that, um, then you can connect to the database. So, We can do show databases. So if we already, you know, pre-created a couple of databases here, and we're going to use the dev database, and we can do show tables. All right. So we have this, you know, customer table created, which is created by this schema.sql script. Um, created this database here and a very simple table um, with uh, ID, username, and email, and a active flag. Um, so customer, we choose uh, we choose to create a sort of a surrogate key uh, generated by the database. Um, depend on how your business want to treat customers. Um, you can use email as your primary key. You know, email usually is uh, unique, um, but uh, depend on your business process, you may also choose to just create a, um, a surrogate key like this. And uh, there's a lot more about schema design and how to choose primary key and data and data types. If you're interested to know more about it, let us know. And uh, again, you know, put a comment below and then we can talk, create a session uh, that way as well. Yes. Uh, after create a table, uh, we'll just insert a few users uh, for the game of Thorn. <laughs> um, fans out there <laughs> were nice. using their names. <laughs> nice. All right. So we can take a look at 
what's already in there. Oops, customer, yeah, all right, okay. So the database and table is ready. Then we can start uh, running codes. Uh, okay, the first thing we want to look at is the index. This is pretty straightforward. You know, we're just, just setting up some uh, routes and um, then we'll, we'll call the back end, um, of which comes from the query uh, .js piece. Let me see, show this better. Okay, all right, to starting out, um, to connect to the, we'll connect to the database. And here we pick up the environment variables and the certificates. Um, and then on the right side, uh, I have a uh, Poson uh, set up. Uh, you can also use curl, but you know, Postman can be uh, fairly easy and uh, a little bit more you know, user friendly. And with this, we're going to start out the, uh, I think it's under example. So Postman, Jesse, maybe for the folks who aren't familiar with that, like, so mm -hmm. is it, does it actually send out um, the request to the, the, the REST server? Is that yes, kind of yes. like you would so, with the curl? Is that is that how it works? And yeah. is that is that a paid tool or is that a a free tool or? Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a free tool. Um, you know, it, it's fairly easy to use. You can just download it. Um, I think they started out as a Chrome um, uh, plugin or add-on, uh, but now you can also download it as a you know standalone uh, app. On, on your Mac or Windows, I think. Got it, okay, great. And, uh, okay, so now we're under here, we can use Notemon to start the REST API and start the app, okay. So before we look at the code, just really quickly to talk about the, um the crud piece of it so crud stands for create um uh r stands for uh read so that gets translated into a select statement in database and um uh, which is a get um uh, protocol and um, in the HTTP world. And then R stands for update, and that is a put uh, call in REST. And then D stands for delete, and that also translates uh, to a delete uh, statement in the database. I don't know if it's possible, Jesse, but could you increase the font size on the Postman interface? Ah, oh, that is a really good call. Oh yeah, awesome, better? perfect, way better, way better. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you, thanks it's for feeling my happy. age. <laughs> oh no, no, not at all. I mean, let's see. Yeah, I I have a fifteen inch laptop here, so <laughs> yeah. the screen is kind of prime uh, real estate right now. <laughs> You're all good. All right. Okay. So first. Let's test this uh, REST server is working, which, ah, all right, let's see. Okay, so it gives us a response um, in the index page. So it looks, it's looking good. Now, next thing we wanted to do is we wanted to create a customer. And on the right side, we see that's a post call and we supply the JSON uh, in the payload. And uh, we will create, let's see, we'll create the customer called on uh, John Stowe. And in return, we got a user ID. 
And let's take a look at the code itself. Uh, sorry, I'm moving kind of things around a little bit. Let me know if I should slow it's down or speed up. Okay, it's all, great. Well, it's good for me. Let us know if we're going too fast in the comments, of course. Uh, cool. Thanks, Ray. And so uh, in the previous, uh, you know, index page, we we showed you that uh, this this URL gets translated and get, we're calling this create customer behind the scene. Um, so we uh, the the connection pool will um, form a uh, query uh, using the payload. And behind the scene, I mean, it, you know, if you're familiar with SQL, it's just a simple SQL. It's nothing, you know, fancy here. Um, and but behind the scene, uh, because we're operating on a distributed um, system database, uh, so we use draft protocol to achieve consensus. And uh, that is how we can ensure the data is, um, you know, uh, durable and also accurate. And uh, because the data is distributed, then if a certain part of the database fail, the rest um, can still survive and continue to operate. So I hope, you know, with that, we can show you or talk at least talk about what's happening behind the scene, even though it just looks like a database that you are familiar with. And next, then we can use the UUID returned to make a get call. All right, so we see that uh, the, the object has been created, uh, it's active and show us uh, it was created uh, earlier. <laughs> I think this is probably a different time zone <laughs> that we can, we can make improvement in the next, you know, sprint. <laughs> Um, and then we can take a look at the code itself. Again, it's a simple, you know, select statement and uh, behind the scene. So when you connect to uh, a CockroachDB, uh, the, the node will, uh, that we connect to is effectively a gateway node. And behind the scene, it will look at uh, which primary key you're accessing, and then contact the node uh, that is holding uh, the lease for that piece of information. And uh, without going through all different, uh, you know, copies that exist on the on the cluster. And that's how we can, you know, achieve a very low latency read uh, yeah. in the distributed environment. All right. And uh, the next piece is update. And that's pretty simple. Uh, in this example, we're just uh, going to update John's email. Uh, all right, so it's got updated. And um, you can see the last update timestamp has changed. And so um, going back to the code, um, it's all it's still you know just a it's just a simple update statement. And uh, uh, CockroachDB use uh, multi-version concurrency control, so we don't update in place, but we create a new copy of uh, that piece of data uh, in. And you can actually do time travel um, as well uh, because we save the older copy and uh, until that copy gets uh, recycled by garbage collection. Jesse, right. I have a question for you from Manish. Yeah. Are queries on non-primary key columns fast? Mm -hmm. And I know the initial 
answer is it depends on the size of the database and the query and whatnot. But um, can you go into more detail than that? Uh, so is the question is, uh, you know, how, how do, if the query, if you query on non-primary key uh, is columns, that fast? Yeah. Is that fast? Yes. So, <clears throat> so first we would need to define fast, but, you know, abstracting right. fast away. Right. So, uh, you can certainly create an uh, index on that column and to make it uh, fast because mm -hmm. under behind the scene uh, for for the table as well as index we basically have a key value pair structure the key uh, the the primary key or the indexed columns becomes the key of that uh, of that kv store and that you can get a very low latency, uh, you know, queries. Does that answer the question? Yes, and we actually we did a, a query optimization module a couple of weeks ago. I will get that link for you. Um, Animesh also has a question: Can we make a single REST API that will serve dynamic query? And that one I sure. don't have an answer for. <laughs> I I would love to take a you know a, a closer look at uh, what your dynamic query looks like and and go from there. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Can we get some more yeah. details on that, Animesh? That would be awesome. I, I was gonna say I think you have examples of that, Jesse, where there's um, query uh, URL parameters that are then passed into the the query, um, I think you do, like, yeah. like on the offset. And th so there is a process of accessing the query parameters in the application code to be able to put those into query, yeah. obviously, with some sanitization. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, this kind of simple parameters you can, you can pass in. Um, if if Manish means you know anything else, then yeah, I would love to see the, the detail. And yeah, we definitely. Can, we can talk Thanks about for it. the questions. M yeah, Manish and Animesh. All right, and uh, then delete is pretty similar. Um, we you know we put a tombstone on the row. And then it will be garbage collected. Um, the default garbage collection is 25 hours, but you can also, you know, tune the number um, based on your uh, workload. And last piece is uh, to get um, a more uh, sort of this query we're thinking about. Uh, you can use it to serve uh, paging. Alpaginations uh, in the UI. So you give it a offset and then give it a, a limit number. And uh, so we we do want it to um, because Cockroach DB is designed for OL uh, TP, the transactional systems. So you want to avoid situations where uh, you need to do in to scan a lot of rows. Um, and so uh, by putting some limits and putting, uh, or if you can have a token on the on the application side, then you can um, put some indexes on the token column. For example, last, last update and things like that to uh, scan even less uh, of the data rows. I think that's all from me. Cool. Yeah. We have a couple of questions from LinkedIn users. How is this serverless database different from the normal database boot times? It, it's almost, I don't want to say instant, we're fighting the speed of light, right? And we want that time to dopamine to be as small as possible, short as possible. It's, it's much faster before you could spin up a database in 10 to 20 seconds. Now it's five to 10 seconds and then 
serverless is constantly watching for you. Um, do you all have something you want to add to that? Yeah, I think it's, you know, it changed the mindset of how you do capacity planning. Mm. And now you don't have to. Uh, because be before then, you know, uh, you want to say, okay, so uh, what's my peak uh, throughput um, QPS I need to, you know, uh, size the cluster for. Um, but if you have, if you're in the retail, then holiday shopping means totally different uh, throughput requirements than, you know, everyday throughput. Then yes. if it's not, if it's not serverless, then you will be sizing uh, for the peak and paying for the capacity that you don't use right. uh, during off-peak hours. Uh, but with serverless, you only pay for what you use. And mm -hmm. actually, if you could um, give, let me share a screen uh, again, that will might help to show some of the um, UIs. Yeah, definitely. Uh, really quickly. Nice and then sharing. based on the application, another LinkedIn user, I don't know if it's the same one though, um, is wondering why the list database brought all of the databases. Does it mount all of the databases by default? I thought we specifically pointed to a not default database. And then Postman was just looking at that single database, but I missed it when it did the return. Right. I think it I think it only returned the tables, the customer tables for that one database. Uh, right. We're only accessing that particular database. Mm -hmm. um, and so in terms of uh, can you see my screen? Yes. You're okay, you're great. still sharing, by the way. Great. So you, um, so the usage is two piece, either it's compute or storage. And so um, storage, as long as you have the data in there, then, you know, that's something that's a cost structure that you will incur. But in terms of this request unit, um, it, it's more on the compute and the IO and network side. And you can see uh, these, uh, you know, these usages. Uh, as we run some requests uh, in the past uh, day or so. And then uh, you can also see the QPS, uh, uh, a quick dashboard here. Mm -hmm. And within the statements, um, you can see the individual statements that is uh, you know, happening behind the scene. And if you need to do tuning, then this is a good place to start uh, to look at the query plans and, and things like that. Um, and just quickly that uh, to answer uh, the question. So you do see, uh, I think mounting a database, maybe it's a slightly different uh, um, idea, um, but the the storage uh, will be there um, as long as you have data stored in there. Um, but you can monitor the request units um, and comparing that with your uh, quota um, depend on your spending limit um, and to monitor your usage that way. Cool. Um... I actually have a lot more questions. John, how long is your demo? Yeah, so I should stop um, here. <laughs> I, can, I can probably cover it in 10 minutes. Um, so uh, <laughs> the reason yeah. I ask is we have so many awesome questions. I kind of yeah. um, want to keep asking them and then maybe we move your demo to tomorrow because I know you're coming back for office hours but oh, Jesse you're not that would be fine too um or we can you know if if we need yeah. to we'll continue it tomorrow kind of thing yeah that's 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 fine I was gonna say also uh with regards to the question around around database 
food times. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's a really good, we were talking right before uh, the session, there's a really good uh, blog post that we recently put out that talks about the serverless architecture. I know and what you're talking about. I'm good. Yeah, you know, honestly, I haven't spent a ton of time going through it. I did a did a once read, and there's some information there about how we uh, keep, you know, when a request comes in, what is what does that mean? How's that served through mm -hmm. uh, what we call like in serverless? There's this idea of like a, a pre warmed, um, you know, function or pod or unit that runs, and so mm -hmm. either through a pre warmed or if, if there's been no activity for a long time, spinning right. up within you know, a second or two seconds. And these, these sort of pre-warmed instances are available also for scaling so that there's, we're talking like you know, milliseconds as you scale up versus um, you know, if, you're, if there's zero activity because you spun this up three months ago as a project, right. uh, that first request in three months might take a, like a couple seconds uh, to, to yeah. be served. And then after that, yeah. it's, ready to go. So, but there's, there's a lot of detail in that blog post. I mean, it's, it's pretty cool. Like, so if you're interested in learning more about that, you definitely check it out. And I want to say, we also have a, a video that I will pull up for you, but in the meantime, I am going to introduce Masin's question, which type of scaling is supported? Cause they later corrected that, that last word. Um, which type of scaling within the database is supported since we don't do sharding? Um, today we're mostly talking about serverless. And so we're, we're saying that we'll do the scaling for you. Like if your database is not using um, all that capacity, then it'll automatically scale down. If it if it's needs a whole lot more, like if it's having a lot of transactions, then it'll scale up to support that. Um, is there an answer for that on the dedicated side though? Which type of scaling is supported? Yeah, do you want me to take that a little bit, Jesse? And you can kind of add in. I feel like it, you know, the serverless, you know, maybe we'll start with serverless and talk about, um, you know, serverless is really designed to scale without you needing to think about how it's scaling, you know, whether it's vertically or horizontally, that's all managed for you. Um, so, but Cockroach serverless or DB serverless is built on top of Cockroach DB that we've been building for six plus years. And there's versions of that that are either, um, Cockroach dedicated in the cloud. And also we do have some customers that do self-hosted. And a lot of that um, is, is very well documented. Um, and really the way, you know, it's designed to be horizontal, horizontally scalable. And part of the way that we do that is um, kind of underlying um, what you're seeing from the database side is a key value store that breaks up the data into ranges of um, up to 512 megabytes by default and distributes them throughout the cluster. Um, and then we optimize for um, accessing and writing that data across those ranges. So, you know, that's really, you know, under the hood, how we achieve the scalability. Um, so those, that cluster, and when you use serverless, think of it as, you know, abstractly, it is a cluster that's backing it, um, you know, that can, that can expand out with adding more, more nodes or, you know, sizing those nodes uh, up. Um, you know, basically, uh, you know, infinitely um, to a certain extent. Um, yeah, and that's really, I mean, the serverless product is designed to be able to make it extremely easy to, to access that power. I mean, it's incredibly powerful. I think um, you, if you're been working with different databases, um, you know, that horizontally scaling is really hard to achieve mm -hmm. after a certain level and you know, what, what I'll talk about probably tomorrow, since, you know, I think this is a good discussion, um, is, is how we've had this uh, serverless for applications for a long time from the application side. And I'll talk a little bit about that with Cloud Run, which is amazing because basically you can write your, uh, your application once, you can deploy it through serverless and you could have one request a day or, you know, hundreds of thousands of requests a day you don't have to re-architect, it's gonna scale up for you. And CockroachDB serverless is the database side of that. 
that makes it so that the database also will scale. You don't have to look at that as a separate nice. uh, technology, which, which for people that have used serverless technology in the past, it's like, okay, well now I've got a back, what size, you know, RDS instance, MySQL, Postgres instance do I need in my cloud provider? You don't need to worry about that anymore. It just scales, scales for you. And scaling up is one part that's super important, but scale down is really important too, because we often yes. have lots of projects and some of them never pan out and that's okay. You're not going to be paying through the roof for a project that's just sitting idle. It just scales yeah. down. Yeah. yeah, nice. So I have more details to follow up on this question. Can we make a single REST API that will serve dynamic query? And we asked for more information and Animesh is back with more information. Um, so defining a dynamic query generically, uh, something like a single insert API for yeah. all of the tables or select API for any table, something like that. And then also, by the way, he said, thank you for, or I should say they thank you for um, the earlier response. Um, does anyone want to take that one? The original question, I thought it better if we saw the original question as well. <laughs> It's, it's kind of generic, and I want to say the answer is yes. Um, that's not a problem. On that, but if yeah. you want to go, Jesse. Um. Yeah, um, I think this dynamic SQL is probably um, on the um, is on the driver or the mm. ORM that you use. Nice, and if that can translate, uh, you know, the REST API into, well, actually, first of all, your, your REST API needs to interpret, you design, you know, the APIs um, to maybe um, dynamically have a table name. And then you, you translate that into, uh, into a SQL. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it basically, it depends on the ORM you're using as to whether or not yeah. that's easily accomplishable. Yeah. And John, what, what do you have? Yeah, I know so you have I something. I know, chomping at the bit. So this, I think it's totally doable, but um, I would look into, you know, there's a whole, whole uh, design best practices around REST APIs. Mm -hmm. So if you're designing a REST API, that only has a couple of endpoints that are super dynamic and powerful and you just want to use it for your own purposes, that's totally fine. I think you could accomplish that in code. Absolutely. But REST APIs are, are meant to be, there's best practices around how to design them. Yeah, and how to document them because typically when you're doing a REST API, I mean, it might be strictly for your application, but even for that, you're going to be collaborating with other people, whether it's internally or externally, publicly. Um, yes. So you want to design it with, specific objects and actions and um there's there's kind of a way of doing it so it's when somebody starts using it they're like oh there i get what this is about and how it works um and there's things like um like the open api specification that people use um that you can there's lots of tools to generate that um and, and you publish that and so i would recommend maybe against doing that more from a REST point of view than kind of what's possible. Do you have a yeah. favorite resource you recommend, Jesse and John, for REST API development? I know it's not something that Cockroach Labs specifically produces, right. but. So I was going to say, um, you know, it's, uh, I don't know the history of the, the company, but but Swagger.io, um, I, I think it's owned by maybe Smart Bear now, but they, um, I don't know if I can pull all this stuff off the top of my head, but they have a ton of um, uh, documentation and also they provide tools for generating documentation. They host documentation for your REST API um, oh, sure. using like the open API specification. They have, I'm looking at a document right now. Maybe I'll post yeah, that in our, uh, our private chat. But uh, all that, yeah, that's a great resource. Go for it. Cool. Yeah, I think uh, the REST API um, is more about having sort of business uh, concepts behind each uh, REST API, like create a user. Mm -hmm. And then, but 
under that uh, create a user, you probably have multiple business process. Maybe you wanted to send a, a verification email. Maybe you know you wanted to start track their usage. So there are multiple underlying like process or other microservices you could call from there. So I think technically even you can do that, but it's more or less um, not recommended, I would say. Yes, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we have only four minutes left today. I want every single one of you to come back here tomorrow because these are awesome questions. And we have run out of time for our second module today. We're going to hit at least one more, also from Animesh. Uh, one more question. What happens if in a large database, it, the response of the database doesn't come within the default rest timeout limit of 100 seconds? How do we tackle that? Da, da, da. We're getting into big data here. I want to see what kind of you know queries you're running, what kind of operations that you're running, and yeah. then what kind of you know. Uh, uh, again, you know, rest rest is under the concept of microservices, right? Mm -hmm. So ideally, you you want it to translate a monolithic, a large sort of database or business operation and put it into smaller pieces yeah. so that you can build you know service meshes inter with internal applications and maybe in external applications as well yeah 100 um, because it sounds like to me a hundred seconds is very long that is a, that's um, very long yeah it's almost two the, minutes yeah the other perspective of this is maybe you know it is something that uh, it's a atomic op business operation that you do need to achieve, then I would look into query optimization um, by changing, you know, your scheme, maybe not schema, but uh, adding indexes mm -hmm. or, you know, different techniques no. uh, to, to speed it up. Definitely. Um, we have time for one more, maybe. Um, I love this one. I'm an Azure buddy. When will CockroachDB be available on Azure? Column level format preserve encryption is supported in particular. That is a great question. We're actually not on the product team, but maybe we have a peek into the roadmap cycle. I will say that no promises, but there are certain platforms that we're definitely working with our partners to uh, make available more widely. And Azure is on the list. So absolutely, um, can't give a timeline or anything, but that is, that's definitely something that our team is very uh, interested in making available for everybody. And you are so welcome. Got through another question. Um, do we have time for one more in 90 seconds or less? Are change feeds resumable, reusable, maybe? Resumable? Maybe. Resumable. Will change feeds always catch up with database updates regardless of load? What is the impact of change feeds on server load? Is that an easy one or should we save that for tomorrow? I think we might need to save it for tomorrow. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so thank you, Jesse. Thank you, John. Jesse is leaving us tomorrow, even though we love her. Um, even though her picture is on the thumbnail, she will be back soon. John will be joining me, maybe with another expert, maybe not. We'll see what happens. We're also going to continue the demo from today, the module from today, and work on CRUD REST APIs again. Um, so bring your API questions, bring your database questions, bring your Cockroach Labs questions. We would love to help you out. Uh, yeah, so have a great day, everybody, and we'll see you tomorrow um, when at the same time. 
Have a good Thanks day, everyone. everyone. Good questions. Thank you. Bye. Such good questions. Yeah. Come back. Mm -hmm.